everyone, and thank you for joining us for uh, today's presentation of Penn GSE's Race in the Academy series. This is the seventh year of our Race in the Academy series, and the purpose of the, of the series is to establish a space for students, faculty, and staff to learn and communicate about issues of race and to establish those discussions as part of the fabric of the school. The series provides a variety of opportunities for members of the Penn community to develop and enhance their understandings of the issues of race and ethnicity in the context of education. Our events typically include research, research presentations, such as the one you'll hear today, by leading scholars followed by a group discussion and are open to all faculty, staff, and students free of charge. I would just like to take a minute to thank our co-sponsors for their generous support of this year's series. They include the Graduate Student Center, Greenfield Intercultural Center, the Center for Africana Studies, the African American Resource Center, the Urban Studies Program, our Association of African American Graduate Students in Education, and Students Confronting Racism and White Privilege. Would you please also mark your calendars for our upcoming speakers. On Thursday, February 16th, is Dr. Rico Gutstein. His title of his presentation is Critical Mathematics as Anti-Racist Pedagogy. He is Professor of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And on Tuesday, March 20th, Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, who will present Rise of the Urban Metropolis, The City as Nightmare, Colorblind Ideology, and Black Community Development. Dr. Taylor is Professor and Director of Urban Studies at SUNY Buffalo. I'd like to introduce Dr. Stanton Wortham, who is our Associate Dean, who will be introducing our speaker. And after the speaker and the Q&A discussion, you are uh, invited to join us for a reception on the other side of the screen. Thanks. Thanks, Lois. Thank you to Lois for organizing the series and all her work behind the scenes to make all of this possible. Thank you all for coming. I'm very pleased that today we have with us Professor Enrique Murillo from California State University, San Bernardino, where he's a professor in Educational Research Methods and Foundations. <laughs> um, I first met Dr. Murillo back when we had both just finished our dissertations back in the mid-90s or so. And he, together with a colleague, Sofia Vienas, were the people who coined the term New Latino Diaspora to describe the phenomenon of especially Mexican but other Latino people moving to areas of the United States that have not traditionally had a Latino presence. And this was an important phase in the development of research on this emerging demographic phenomenon because it gave reality to this pattern that people had been seeing pieces of it, but they were able to envision it as a larger process and place it within the socio-historical context of the movement of Spanish-speaking and other indigenous peoples through the Americas and European colonization and various related historical processes. So it was an important moment to crystallize that for us, and he pulled together a group of people at a AAA symposium, I think it was in 1997 when I first met him, and his own work, he worked in the South, in North Carolina, he got his doctorate at UNC, and he worked on the racialization of Mexican immigrants in North Carolina and various um, projections that they had to endure as they came to these new locations. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Murillo's work has been interesting and explored these phenomena, but he is an extremely impressive person because as a young person, just having finished his doctorate, he started his job at Cal State San Bernardino, and next thing I know, he's just started as a beginning assistant professor, and I get this email saying, hey, I'm starting a journal. I've decided that we need a journal on Latinos in education, and we're going to call it the Journal of Latinos in Education, and would you be willing to serve on the editorial board for a couple of years? And I was thinking, wow, you know, I'm trying to figure out whether I'm going to be able to publish my second paper this year, and this guy's already editing a journal and starting it. Mm -hmm. And he got a publisher who was interested, and now this journal has published all sorts of important work on all sorts of issues with respect to Latinos in education. And so I was extremely impressed that this young man who was able to just say, I'm going to do this. There's a need in the world. There's a social need to do it. There's a need in the academy for the sort of research that's being published on these phenomena. And he just did it. He pulled it together. And that journal is still going strong, and he's still editing it and doing a wonderful job. And so I was figuring, wow, so here's a guy who's doing interesting research, and he's coined this phrase of the new Latino diaspora, and he started this journal, and so he's really having a remarkable academic career. And then a couple of years later, I got another email that said, you know, that I'm going to start something else. I'm going to do this, what he's going to describe for you today, this sort of online movement where it's a source of information for academics practitioners and people in communities about Latino education and the challenges and opportunities that are facing Latinos and educators who want to work with them in schools. 
And this is a remarkable thing where he's had Barack Obama participate in events that he's organized. He's had all sorts of remarkable people working virtually, sometimes in place in California where most of the work is focused, but also virtually around the country and even beyond the country participating in these advocacy activities that are bringing together academic work together with various sorts of activists and practitioners to try to improve the lives and outcomes of Latino kids around the country. So not content just to launch a new and important line of academic research, not content just to launch a new journal and to provide a voice for people doing work in a field, but also now using the internet and the capacities of new network technologies in order to do advocacy and research and distribute it. It's a remarkable thing for someone who is still a young man who is still doing this sort There's of work. There's a lot of gray here, though. And, <laughs> right. That's just, that's, <laughs> he uses product to create. <laughs> <laughs> but we're really pleased to have Dr. Rio here with us, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. You really made me sound pretty good. I'm like, this needs to be. I think I want to meet this guy. He <laughs> really made me sound pretty good. Um, Okay, well, um, I guess I just start off with with very descriptions of myself, okay? So, um, uh, those of us, particularly those of, uh, who come out of poverty, working class backgrounds, people of color in general, um, you know, we, we come to the academy, we don't come on our own steam, all right? We stand on the shoulders of, of many people. I myself am... Uh, uh, the, the child of Mexican immigrants. My uh, parents are from Cuyacan, Sinaloa. My mother is also a Tawe, uh, which is a Native American uh, Yaqui. We're part of the Yaqui group. We're on both sides of the U.S. and Mexican border. So I actually have three citizenships. So I'm a U.S. citizen, a Mexican citizen, and a Tawe citizen. And I have three different identifications. So, for example, I just came back from Mexico and, and um, and uh, uh, I entered as, uh, uh, excuse me, I, I, I entered as a Mexican citizen, so I showed my Mexican citizen uh, certificate of Mexican nationality. And then um, when it's convenient, I'm a U.S. citizen, right, <laughs> whenever I had a, a U.S. citizen. And I was crossing the, the border uh, from Tijuana back to, to San Diego, and the, uh, the, uh, the Border Patrol asked me, hey, what citizens, what's your citizenship? I told them, I'm Yaki. And they just, they don't, need, they don't even bother. They don't, you know, they don't bother. And I do that oftentimes, even when I'm at the airport, because um, we're protected under federal law, that they're not supposed to, uh, you know, I'm also a, a, a registered uh, spiritual leader. So uh, I, I, sometimes I carry, um, uh, uh, Tobacco, paraphernalia, uh, things that we use in our religion, in our native religion, right? Um, uh, sometimes, you know, in our religion we use pipes, we, we have feathers and so forth. So that nobody's supposed to go in there and, and touch your stuff, you know, it's like being a priest. Nobody's supposed to go in there and touch your stuff. So I, I take advantage of that too. So sometimes I'm at the airport and they want to go through my stuff and say, hey, hold on, hold on. Uh, if you want to go through my stuff, I'll show it to you, you know, do that. So. But um, all that oppositional um, culture and resistance just comes from growing up in a bifurcated reality, right? So uh, at home, it, it, we speak Spanish. We, um, uh, you know, very working class neighborhood. Uh, and at school, it's English. You know, they, they just, they forced us to learn English, right? And even to the to the point where now we speak Spanish uh, in reverse, we, we, so we even lost our elements of our Spanish uh, because they forced us, and uh, and um, and we just have very little bit of our of our uh, native language, so we kind of go between all three worlds. So maybe bifurcated, trifurcated, maybe is it three trifurcated? So it's a trifurcated reality. So kind of so, but um, here's the interesting thing: is that in our new global economy and new world order, it's that flexibility, it's the flexible ontologies, the flexible epistemologies that actually are uh, uh, to our advantage, right? So the more languages you speak, the, the, the more flexible you are, the more fluid you are between worlds, right? If you can travel to different countries, speak different languages, um, 
uh, code switch, um, right? Switch modalities. We were talking about this more switch modalities. Uh, all these things, it's actually to our advantage in, in this kind of new globalized uh, reality we lived in. So um, uh, politically, I identify as Chicano, right? Because it's all kind of the tail end of the Chicano movement. My uh, father was a union organizer, so I, I grew up in that environment. My grandfather fought in the Mexican Revolution. So a few generations of kind of, we like to fight and we struggle. So I kind of grew, grew up around that environment. So uh, uh, I uh, made a decision that, you know, if I'm going to go to the university, that really we ha uh, uh, we're not there on our own steam. I don't see myself as just kind of being an individual. Oh, I did it. I you know, made it by myself. I, you know, I got my undergraduate from UCLA, and I got a master's in, in teaching credential, and then my doctorate from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. But the dilemma, the, the dilemma as Chicanos is that um, we got one foot in the community and one foot in the academy, and we're kind of halfies. And we, and we deal with this whole dilemma. And it's, and I'm gonna, and it's not just us. It's, it's working class. It's, it's, it's poor whites. It's all, all sorts of groups. We deal with the same thing of kind of being halfies. Uh, same with ethnography. You know, we're kind of half, half ethnographers. Uh, and we can talk about that if you want to afterwards. Um, but uh, this idea that um, we're almost um, fraudulent. So how am I, what is it that I'm doing here at UCLA? How come I'm here at the University of North Carolina? These are prestigious universities. Somehow I got here. And so um, many of our, our efforts as Chicano, Latinos, a lot of our efforts, a lot of our, our energy comes from this desire to give back to our community, right? That, that we, we don't, we, um, we give back. And that, that's kind of, that's, so in everything, in the scholarship and anything that you do. So it took me a long time to get to where I'm at. Um, and right now it's, uh, it's interesting because I'm, uh, a lot of my research, a lot of my projects I've been working on, they've been around for 20 years, but nobody's really paid all that much attention other than kind of these small groups of folks. All of a sudden, Latinos are a big issue. Why? Because, well, first of all, because, um, uh, I mean, there's always been a Latino educational crisis for generations. For hundreds of years, it, it depends on what, if you want to put it in a historical context, there's always been a Latino educational crisis. But the difference between then and now is scale, right? So our demo, there's just been a huge demographic boom in the United States of, of Latino immigrants, right? Mostly Mexican and Central American, but from people from everywhere. But our participation in higher education, our participation in the formal economy is not keeping up to pace with the demographic growth. So people are saying, especially now that the economy is really low, they're interested, oh, where do Latinos fit in the economy? They want to know where, you know, where that fits. And um, how are we going to keep up with, the, with uh, uh, other countries in terms of, um, the, people starting to see the connection between the competitive strength of our economy in, in terms of our global competitiveness to, there's a connection there with Latinos. In other words, the, the economy of the U.S. is not going to get better until Latinos get better, right? It's real simple. People's Social Security are not going to get paid unless we invest in Latino students now. So when they, because in, in, they're investing in the, it's, the, I mean, there's a very, there's a very um, uh, uh, self-centered, selfish argument that that a lot of people are are paying attention to. People who didn't pay attention before, right? So here, here's, part of the, here's part of the issue is describing the Latino crisis, right? And I, I, um, I, uh, I didn't have a PowerPoint. I just have some points here uh, for myself um, just to help me talk a lot, you know, talk. So you don't, it may be kind of hard to follow the, the, uh, this projection, but I'll speak it out. All right, so let me see here. Okay, so... Um, here's the idea. For the Latino community, well, all of us are experiencing the, uh, what's going on with the economy, right? We have all these issues around health, health access, 
um, for Latinos, we deal especially, uh, for a lot of folks, with the immigration, all these things. So on top of all that, we got to deal with one more thing, and that's this educational crisis. What does that mean? Well, well um, the new census says that we're, we are one, in, in, um, one in, in six people now in the United States. So one in every six. I think it's more, personally. One in six. Uh, but for school-age children, that's one, it's one in four. Right, so 25% now of all public school children are Latino. That's a, that's, that's a lot of kids, right? <laughs> that's a lot of kids. Um, so there's a lot of attention uh, paid to us. So um, we're the fastest growing and, and so forth. But part of our issue um, in the United States is, uh, for example, in the Latino community, uh, uh, perhaps as high as 70% of our kids do not have access to pre-K, 70%, right? It's not that uh, 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 immigrant parents or uh, even third, fourth generation uh, Latinos don't want to send their kids to pre-K. That's not the issue. The thing is that they don't have access to it. In a lot of communities, and I don't know, and I'm not too familiar with this community, but I suspect it, uh, it's probably similar here. I'm sure there's a very significant uh, amount of uh, Latinos here in this city do not, do not have access to the pre-K. Um, so that's like a, 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 a huge one, right? What's going on with this thing? It's kind of weird, huh? So I'll use that. So once we get to school, right, there's a, I guess in, in educational anthropology, um, I guess they call it the uh, handshake problem, right? So the school culture and the home culture have a hard time Shaking hands, all right? It, like it doesn't fit right, right? So that's like a huge thing, uh, uh, how to deal with that mismatch, right? And even, and even so, once we get into school, right, Latinos, by and large, we attend the schools with the least amount of funding, right? The least amount of staffing, right? Um, the high poverty, racially segregated, it's like a perfect storm, like everything that you can think of, right? That's the conditions of Latino students, right? So it's a serious uh, educational crisis. Uh, in California, it's real similar to other parts of the United States, is that uh, as you go through the school system, uh, there's a lot, they're still tracking. You can call it whatever you want, they're still tracking. They're, they're still, you know, if you're going to go here, if you're going to go to college, you're going to be in this class and so forth. So, Make a long story short, only 50% um, uh, of our Latino students graduate from high school. This is nationwide, nationwide. So imagine out of 100 kids, only 50 uh, finish high school. But here's the strange thing about it. Yeah 50, yeah, 50 kids finish high school, but only 25 kids, so really half of those that finish high school, only 25 of them have the actual requirements to get into college, right, to seek higher education. So really, when you think about it, in terms of our participation of higher ed, it's just, it's, it's a quarter, it's just one fourth of our kids, right? And then, um, and then from there, you can just go down, go down, so out of 25, um, 10 will actually go on to higher, so 25 are uh, eligible, 10 are gonna go on to, to college somewhere, the majority of us start up community college. Unfortunately, community colleges uh, have tended to be, in a lot of places, sort of like a roach motel. Excuse me for <laughs> that's the, the analogy. It's a terrible analogy. You can get in, but you can't get out, right? <laughs> so you can, get in the, you can get in the community college, but um, you, can, you can never get the classes to get the transfer curriculum. So you just get a, a, you know, a, a bunch of young folks who they, they just get stuck in the community college and never are able to move on, right? So out of those who do move on, um, you, you're going to get, uh, it just depends on what different subgroup of uh, Latinos, but you're just going to get a handful who are actually going to finish with their bachelor's degree. And then it just goes down there for master's, doctorate. So I myself, as a you know, Chicano Latino uh, uh, doctorate, uh, we're something like half of 1%, of, if, if you can think about it. So we're about half of 1%. So, 
that's kind of like my journey, right? If you think about it, I'm the uh, uh, swimming, swimming upstream, right? So. Okay, so uh, here's, here's the thing now. So a lot of people are interested in Latinos all of a sudden. Well, again, because it's a matter of scale, right? So um, uh, education really, not, not just for Latinos, for all of us, really, it's the civil rights issue of our generation, right? It's, it's, it's at that level, right? So we have to really take up the banner and start doing the work, right? This is the civil rights, and it's the economic imperative, right? If, um, there's, there's uh, it's real simple to explain to, especially those who, who have, who believe in the, uh, have the logic of the economy and they kind of measure themselves in terms of how well the economy is doing. It's real simple. Education is economic development. That's what it is, right? Now, that's not all what it is, right? There's education for democracy and education for this, right, that. But right now, because of the economy, that seems to be, the rhetoric that most people understand, oh, I see, I understand, right? So really, it's, it's, it's economic imperative, right, that we have to deal with this. Why? Because we need to, we need to take uh, uh, folks out of the shadow and into the light, right? Help them get through the school system, formal schooling. People need to participate uh, uh, all, the, all the way through in, in, our, in our society, right? So that's the challenge. That is the big challenge. So, um, uh, 20, 15 years ago when I was you know, a doctorate student, uh, and this goes back to what uh, Staten was mentioning earlier, is that um, what we found out was that um, as, a, you know, as a master's student and then a doctoral student, there wasn't a lot, uh, there wasn't a lot of research out there. I mean, there was, but it was very sporadic. Um, uh, things published here, published there. There's still a lot of, I guess, what they call academic colonialism. The Latinos are seen as peripheral and really not, not center, right? So we're marginal, not center. Okay, and um, so you know, what do you do when something doesn't exist? Well, you got to create it yourself, and that's basically uh, what we did. Right? We created a, 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 a journal where we could start disseminating and publishing our own work, right? Uh, there's a whole other topic there about the politics of getting your work published and all that, which I won't go into now. But it's, all, it's related to, to part, of, part of the legitimacy of the academy, right? So how do, you, how do you legitimize yourself, legitimize your work in the academy? Well, you gotta publish, right? You gotta write articles, you gotta write books, you gotta do presentations, you gotta be involved in, in, in professional development, those kinds of things. So that's what we did uh, with a handful. Stan was one of them, the, a bunch of us got together and so said we just, we gotta just do it, right? And, 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 and be, and not apologize for it, right? Basically we are a legitimate field of inquiry, right? We've been doing this for a lot of generations, you know, but it's time to, to, to kind of, to put our flag in the ground and say, boom, we state, we, you know, claim our state. And that's kind of what we did. So we created the Journal of Latinos in Education. It, it now, after so many years, it appears on many tier one uh, lists of academic journals. We have more than 92,000 uh, subscriptions worldwide. It's, it's become a huge thing. Uh, but there's a lot of naysayers, a lot of people who thought it was just going to be, a oh, it's a magazine. Uh, oh, that's nice. You you put together a magazine, or it's like no, this is a this is a research journal. It's a it's legitimate uh, a, a scholarly journal, right? And we just got to do it. So we did it, and um, even though uh, it created a, a bunch of stuff, uh, um, we I guess we were um, uh, called like, we, like we're somehow we're being trying to be separatist or whatever. Like no, I mean it's just. It's legitimate, and, and part of it, part of the thing is that we just know that as we become more uh, uh, global, really borders only exist for people, right? Borders don't exist for money, right? It doesn't exist for information, right? A little bit, places like China, Cuba, I just got back from Cuba uh, a few months back. There's still, there's, 
but for the most part, you know, the money and information, it, it's, it, it can go anywhere. It's, all, it's free to do what it wants, right, for the most part. Uh, borders exist for people, right? So um, we, we've always ha had to break down barriers, break down bar borders. Um, and, and in this case, it's academic, it's academic, right? So if we have to uh, become coyotes, right? We become our own coyotes and we have to, we have to uh, move across those academic terrains, uh, those academic boundaries to, to create something that's never been there before. And we did it. And, um, but because of that, because of the, the Journal of Latinos Education, it solidified a network, right? A network, because there's a lot of people out there right, who are interested in these issues, right, so, um, so, uh, actually, let me, let me play around with this to show you a few things. Okay, so I have to go like this, Ta -da. oh, wow, this thing got, got all crazy, all right. Okay, so there's the journal. I don't know what's going on with this thing. It's kind of, uh, let me see if I can do something here. Uh, zoom, let me, uh, can I reset it? How's that? Okay, so, all right, so there's, there's, there's the journal, right? It comes out four times a year. And, um, and so now there's people who've, who, uh, thanks to these efforts, they're, legi they're legitimate scholars getting tenure. Hey, I, I published in the Journal of Latinos in Education. We, we have a 88% rejection rate, so only 12, only 12% 12 publication, right? That's prestigious. People see that, oh, really? Why? There's a lot of people who, who submit articles and, um, and, and doing that. So, but the, the point is that out of this project came the National Latino Education Network. Okay, so let me. Come on, come on. I just want to reset. Okay, well, it goes. Okay. Okay, so this predates the MySpace Facebook revolution. Right? This, we started this in 2000, although uh, that's in 2003, we finally got it online. So what we realized is that really, it's the network. That's where the strength is, the power. Why? Because there's just one person over here at this university who's, who works on these issues, right? There's just one person over there, right? They're standing by himself over there in the, in the corner office uh, working on diaspora, stuff and there's so and so and there's this and that and so really the the strength is in the network so it's like you create a network of folks of professionals who are interested in the same kinds of issues so back then email and list oh my god a listserv was like a the technology yeah, oh you had a listserv you mean i could send out an email to 200 people at the same time that was huge you know back then, you know back then many of you probably don't remember i don't you know um, some of you i'm sure you remember uh, all that, and that's if you even did email, right? Uh, it took people a while to kind of catch on. What we take for granted now, I mean, it wasn't, uh, you had to kind of force people to do email uh, e even 10 years ago, um, and so forth. So, so what we did is we, okay, so we're gonna take what we know about Latino education, we're gonna create a, a directory, right? So we have, we've had th we have thousands of members now um, on this directory. We're gonna create a clearinghouse, so this is free, so then if you want to join, just go to nlen.csusb.edu, and it's, it's free, it's been free for, for 10 years. Um, you can get all sorts of uh, resources, guides, and, it's, and we update it uh, you know, a couple times a month with all sorts of new stuff. Um, I send out newsletters. Uh, are, you, are you on that, Stan? Do you get the news? Yes, we, so anything happens, we do newsletters. and. Um, and one thing that we started doing when we created NLEN, we started webcasting across the internet. So we, we created our own shows. 
So it's been almost 10 years now that we, we create, you know, why? Because I mean, we don't own CBS, we don't own NBC Universal, uh, uh, we're not the head of uh, C-SPAN or CNN. So uh, the closest thing is that we kind of created ourselves. So for 10 years back, People thought we were nuts, it didn't make sense, but now it's like people take it, oh yeah, you're webcasting across the internet, like it's no, no big deal. But this was very revolutionary 10 years ago when, um, and here's, here's a basic idea. Okay, and, and we're doing this tonight, in fact, although it's gonna be in post-production, that yeah, there's a handful of people in the room, right? But if you stream it, ac stream it across the internet, you got anybody worldwide can plug in. And that, that democratizes, it's a, it has a, a democratizing effect, right? It's, it opens it up to anybody, right? So we do all sorts of things. We've been doing, for the last 10 years, um, these, these uh, webcasts uh, where we, uh, we help uh, kids uh, how to apply for financial aid, right? We, we do programs in Spanish to, uh, for parents, right? The, uh, parent-to-parent -parent, uh, uh, models where one parent's kind of helping another parent, uh, asking questions, answering stuff, that, that kind of stuff, right? So we, we've been doing that. Um, and uh, so finally at some point uh, we said, okay, well now it's time to write the handbook of Latinos in education, right? So the next project was the handbook. Okay, and like always, you gotta play with the big guys, right? So we, you know, so you have to make a contract with the, with uh, with Taylor Francis, right? Huge power broker in the publishing world. They they bought up Routledge. So one of the first projects is, hey, we want to we want to get in on that. So we put together a handbook. Um, the handbook in in total uh, brought in four hundred about four hundred scholars maybe 450 all together from all over the United States and some in Latin America and Europe. Uh, here's the idea that, uh, and it's, it's kind of akin to, I don't know if any of you have read uh, uh, Occupied America from Rudy Acuna in 1970. Okay, so um, in the 70s, uh, this landmark, landmark book basically said, we are Chicano studies and we declare ourselves Chicano studies. Y aquí estamos y no nos vamos. So we're not going anywhere. Here we are. All right. So we kind of did the same thing here with this handbook. So we, we are a legitimate field of inquiry, right? There's people, there's at universities, there's, there's a Latino education professor and there's a distinguished professor of Latino education. There's this and that. It's a legitimate inquiry in our field. And so we've kind of declared it. One thing that we saw here is that a lot of the veterans, a lot of the veteranos, were retiring, people were dying off, people were growing old. Uh, so we have to kind of pass on the baton to the next generation. So when um, one thing that's, that's huge in, in kind of the Latino educational community is that we, we have to mentor each other, right? We have to become each other's coyotes, smuggle ourselves, you know? So quite often um, a professor adopts you and helps you with your doctorate or helps you get across that academic border, socializes you, right? That's kind of like, I guess, a, a good advisor does, that socializes you into, the, into the, this world of academia. So um, what we did is we, for all our chapters, we paired off a veteran scholar with a mid-career or, or emerging scholar, a new, a new, somebody who's barely starting off, and we forced them to write together. So uh, every, uh, I can't remember right now, I think we have 30 or 40 chapters in this handbook. Every chapter, almost everyone, there's a, exceptions, but let's say about maybe 99% of them, they're co-written between a veteran scholar and, and, and a new person. And, and that's, that way you get the, the perspective of someone who's been around for a lot of years doing this kind of work and somebody who's the, the new person emerging. And that, that mentorship, that collaboration is huge. It's a huge theme for us. Um, the other thing is advocacy, right? Um, by and large, we see ourselves, uh, Latino educators, we see ourselves as um, 
the one in, in a million folks who are not here, right? That we're not here, again, we're not here on our own steam. We stand on the shoulders of others, right? We walk on the backs of other folks, and that's how we got to the university. So it's really, it's, we're, we're committed to giving back to our community, right? It's very important that we give back to our community. And sometimes a lot of our scholarship um, becomes almost like a litany, right? Because we, we may even feel guilty because we ourselves are in diaspora from the fields, from the factories, right? Um, and so, uh, and then we deal with a whole bunch of issues where, um, where uh, especially if, if you're first generation or second generation, where your parents or grandparents may not speak, may not be English dominant, you're dealing with that. But then also with the working class issues, uh, you know, kind of having a working class aesthetic, but then at the same time at the university, we have very awkward forms of privilege that become associated with being part of the university. Nobody understands, and your family understands what you do. You can't really can't explain, uh, you know, what you, what you're doing, that kind of stuff. So there's all sorts of dilemmas that take place with us. Sometimes we feel like we're frauds. Do I belong here? And we question, we doubt ourselves. And so one way to deal with that, all that is that we focus our energies towards advocacy, right? And so we've always been looking for a model for something where we can tie the, um, very good, where we can tie, um, and this may go back to the Plan de Santa Barbara in 1970, where there's, um, we need to uh, connect the university and the barrios, right? So we see, see ourselves like that, right? So we connect the two. Um, so because we ourselves are in diaspora, talk to almost any Latino educator in, in, or, or academic and almost always they'll say, oh yeah, um, uh, the community, they, the, the focus on the community, they, they write about the community. Um, very nostalgic, right? A lot of our work is very nostalgic. It's, uh, it's connected somehow to the community. Um, uh, so we've always had to deal with those dilemmas. And I think working class people in general deal with those dilemmas. So a lot of the, a lot of the themes for in the handbook has to do with advocacy. How do we advocate? It's not enough to to um, to write about uh, to do research and, and write. That, that that seems to fall short. It, it's good for my career, right? I I put, I have uh, I don't know like seventy publications, and I I visited a lot of countries and I've presented and I it's great for me. Hey, but in real terms, how have I, what have I done for my community? How have I given back? So this is the, always, the questions we're always asking ourselves. How have we, how we, how we given back? So now as a, as a full professor, as a tenured professor, with all that behind me, um, I'm uh, in a position now where uh, I can connect and work on these projects that deal with the advocacy aspects of it, right? Not just the research, right? Um, the research is the base, right? So in this kind of movement, if I could describe it as a movement for the last 20 years, that really it's research-based, right? All our decisions have to be research-based, right? It can't just be uh, an emotional, um, visceral response for politics, you know, political, that, that, that has to be re kind of research-based. So we spent all this time building up a, ba a research base. So we, we kind of know what works, what doesn't work. We, we have an idea of things, but we don't have the power, right? Uh, sometimes, even though the university is the dominant hegemonic institution in our society, as academics, we really don't have that power, right? But there, there is power in, in the network, right? And so you, you, you connect with folks and you do all sorts of things. So I've, uh, you know, I've, so I've spent the last uh, five years working on these advocacy projects. So um, all that explanation <laughs> was to get me to where I'm at now. How much time do I got? Oh, okay, very good. Okay, so let me tell you about the LEAVE projects. All right. Before you fall asleep, I know some of you are like, yawning. And, uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, right here.
So, um, uh, when I finished uh, editing the handbook, putting together the handbook, there was a lot of attention. A lot of people started asking questions, you know. So we said, okay, we're gonna launch the handbook. So in launching, doing like a public launching of a book, um, you know, you try to bring attention to the issue. So the attention here is the Latino educational crisis. And you know what, people are listening. They, they see, they, they're listening, right? Finally, after 20 years, right? Uh, people outside the small circles are, are actually paying attention and listening. And, um, and so we launched the handbook of, of Latino education. So um, we decided, okay, well, let's, let's put on a conference. Let's put on a summit, quite typical of a uh, university. Let's put on a, a one-day conference. But this one-day conference tr turned out to be a huge thing because there's just so many people interested in the issue. In the issue. So uh, what we did is when we had our first summit, this is three years ago now, there's, there's 1,200 people in the room. But again, we're web, remember, we're webcasting this. So we, have a, we put a camera there. We, we were able to recruit 1,300 other universities across 18 countries to participate in our, in our conference. So now you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people participated in our conference. It was huge. It's like a big record-breaking thing. So if you can imagine, um, you know, so we're here presenting and so forth. Uh, the camera's there. So the camera's streaming across the internet in real time. There's, there's a Facebook function, there's a Twitter function, and then there's the online chat. So as you're watching the conference, there's all these people who are having conversations. They're chatting about everything. They're asking questions and so forth. And, um, you know, and a, lot, a lot of universities are looking for ways to diversify their faculty, their students, their curriculum. They're looking to internationalize their curriculum. So this is an easy gig. Hey, come, wa come watch us on the internet, right? So, um, so these 1,300 other universities, and I don't know if you have one here or not. Uh, did, you, did you guys have a watch party here? Okay, so, so we're gonna have one this year though, right? <laughs> so and then in March, this one's on Wednesday, March 28th. Um, so for this one, is we just you gather folks here, just like we are now, and so we're watching on the big screen, and people are participating, and that created an even larger network. Out of that, um, the Inland Empire, where I'm, where I'm from, this little region of Southern California, we got the lowest going college going culture, I think, in the United States. We got uh, uh, very uh, high uh, dropout slash pushout rates everything. So there's a lot of attention all of a sudden to our region. So now all of a sudden, here's the, here's the interesting paradox is that as these Latino education projects are reaching out worldwide, there's also a focus inward to our own local regions. So now we're working with partners. We, we have uh, 1,500 partners now of, of people who are working on their own projects. And what we do is that we're a network and we call ourselves uh, Netroots. Um, is, is what we call ourselves. So it's, it has to do with the net, network, but also the internet, using um, internet-based technologies to connect people like that. And then the grassroots, because so it's the advocacy, right? And that's always been, that's always been um, our, our, uh, our connection. How do you stay connected with community, right? It's funny because I, um, I gave a presentation maybe a couple months ago with Rudy Acuna himself, right, the author of, uh, of uh, Occupied America, and that's, that was, just, he talked about the same thing that we're talking about now. How, how do you give back to the community? How are you connecting? But the difference between then and now is that now we have the internet, and we can, we can use the technologies for our own purposes, right, to, for democracy, to create moments, spaces that are much more democratic, right? So, so this, this thing became huge. Even uh, the White House, uh, President Obama gave, uh, gave a talk and he used kind of the tenets of the handbook. So I got invited to the White House, I went to the East Room, I got to witness him authorizing a, um, a, uh, the Hispanic Initiative for the, his, uh, the Educational Initiative for Hispanics, can't remember the name, the full name of it now. Uh, a lot of folks, uh, coming, they want to be part of it. So, um, in the context 
of meeting with these 1,300 universities and all these people across the internet, what we did is we started collecting uh, agenda items, right? What are the agenda items that we need to work on? Okay, so let me share those with you. Okay, so um, if you could imagine, um, in fact, our impact numbers this year totaled more than 17 million people. So that means, um, so not just that, we start, we, we're doing internet radio. So we have a million listeners now on our in internet radio show, right? So we do things off the internet and we do this, we do all these things. So over the course of the last three or four years, we've been collecting, what are the agenda items, what are the tasks? that we came up with. So we did a narrative analysis, right, of, of the, the, the reoccurring themes, right? And so here, here they are. So number one was we got to learn the traits, backgrounds, cultural histories, and diversity of and among Latinos, right? Latino doesn't mean anything. Hispanic doesn't mean anything. It's just an umbrella term, right? But there's a difference between a Dominican and a Mexican, right? And the difference between someone from El Salvador and somebody from Argentina. And we got to... And, and, and we got to research and we got to know who people are, right? That cultural specificity is very important. Um, and nationality, especially, is very important. So, uh, the second one was we got to build teacher and counselor education programs which have an explicit student home culture component so educators not only be sympathetic, but appreciative and sensitive of students' backgrounds and willing to structure the schooling experiences to be compatible with students, right? So another way of saying this is, is culturally relevant or culturally appropriate or whatever you want to call it, right? But that, that's a big re Now, keep in mind, these are, these are educational professionals, but they don't use the words like culturally relevant. I mean, that's a specific term that we use in, uh, in a discourse within certain circles, but that's kind of like what they're describing, that that's a big thing, that we have to deal with that mismatch between home and, home and school. Okay, third one that came up was create qualified teachers that have specialized knowledge and skills in language acquisition, biliteracy, and cross-cultural learning. Um, and here's the other thing. We've got to build our own teachers, right? There's, there's not enough Latino teachers. Not that you need to be Latino to teach Latino kids, but by and large, there's very few Latino teachers if you look at uh, the percentage numbers. So, we, you know, same thing. We've got to build our own, right? So, uh, so now we're starting to work on these pipeline projects where we can get kids in middle school interested in teaching and we're going to follow them right and then um, so we're working with one group now in Coachella where in, in middle school they're in a teaching academy and then in, and then they go on to the, the high school and they continue with that teaching academy uh, we, come up with, we help uh, uh, facilitate scholarships Right, so a lot of the, the folks they give scholarships to you know to these kids. Many of them are on financial aid, right? They qualify for, for financial aid, um, but uh, they go on to the community college. That community college just feeds into the four-year institutions. But they they then got to come back to the communities and serve the community in which in which uh, they came from or, or similar. Right? So the idea here is to create an organic linkage. Why? Because uh, unfortunately, a lot of teachers are strangers to the very communities in which they teach. Right? So one of the most important things that we've learned in the research is you cannot be a stranger to the, the people you're, you're supposed to be of service to. Right? If, you're, if you're supposed to be of service to this community, you got to know who they are, where they're coming from, and, and that's just across all class, race, everything. You know, that's just... That's just common sense, you, you gotta know, right? The, here's a fourth one, and this is very similar to our work in, in Latino diaspora. You gotta research the social reception received by Latino families and the impact of this on the learning of children, right? Now, my work in North Carolina, the, the families there were not wanted. Well, let me put a caveat there. Their labor 
was wanted. We want your labor. We want you to work in the poultry uh, factory. We want you to take care of our hogs. We want you to, to do this and that. But I don't want you to live, I don't want you to be my neighbor, right? And so, so that, that there's an impact there on learning. And we're starting to learn that there, there really is, it's not just a, a fig, in figurative ways, there's, there's a real impact on the way children learn if they feel that there's very little social reception in the community that they can live in, right? So that's another thing. Okay, here's a big one. Uh, combat the deficit views of Latinos, right? So in the public sphere, Latinos are, um, are often portrayed as uh, uh, dirty, chaotic, um, other, those kinds of things, right? And even in, in our, in, even in everyday discourse, so one of the things, one of the, the, the recurring themes is how do we, how do we combat these deficit views, right? And, and this is very particularly important in schools, right? So how do, we, how do we see the students' culture and language as a pedagogical resource? That you are not a problem. Your child being in my classroom is not a problem. It's an opportunity, right? They're, 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 um, uh, and, if you, and if you take advantage of the students' uh, language and culture, you can figure out ways to incorporate that so it's not deficit, not view this deficit as you're lacking, right? How much time I got? Okay. Okay, so a couple more things. Uh, here's a big one. And, um, in fact, I'll just stop with this one. There's a few more you can look at it. The um, parents. We've got to engage parents. Right? So create meaningful, trusting, horizontal, and reciprocal relations with Latino parents and extended family. Unfortunately, in a lot of schools, student, the schools don't know how to deal with parents. Right? They just they don't know how. Right? And there's, a lot, there's been a lot of really good work lately in the last few years about Latino parents, really good stuff. But by and large, we just don't know how to deal with what place do parents have. Right? And um, for Latino parents in particular, it's interesting is that we don't show up on the radar. So the conventional middle class descriptions of what a parent's supposed to do for the child, right? Latino parents oftentimes, what they do for their child does not show up on the school's radar. So schools tend to think, oh, Latino parents don't care. They don't value education. And that's BS. It's not. Latino parents do value education. They just do so in ways that don't show up readily on, on the school's uh, radar. I don't know what else analogy to call it. So to make a long story short, based on these agenda items, so now the lead organization, Latino Education Advocacy Days organization, now we've taken upon ourselves to, to then uh, start addressing and incorporating projects that, around these themes. So the, mo the latest project we did is we, we have a public-private partnership with uh, Telemundo, right? And I don't know if, if any of you saw this, but we, uh, Telemundo Spanish language uh, television conglomerate, we, we, uh, they approached me and they said, hey, we wanna, put it, we wanna uh, create a program on Latino education, right? So the first thing I told them is, okay, um, that's great, but we wanna create, if there is gonna be a, a program, it has to be real advice, real tips that we can give parents. Not just talking down, not just telling them the same old middle class um, stuff like uh, keep magazines on your coffee table or whatever, you know. I mean, there was no coffee table when I, I mean, I'm, I don't think I saw a coffee table until I was in my 20s. So I don't even know what that was, right? So uh, you guys hear what I'm saying, right? So, so uh, we put together a program and, um, and, uh, NBC Universal has this program, this programming called Education Nation. And I got picked to be one of 30 or so uh, thought leaders this year. I got to come here to New York City and, and participate in the whole thing. But, um, but the, uh, make a long story short is that the power of television was huge because um, uh, they reported 54 million aggregate television viewers, right? So let me see here. I can write a book, and I don't know, a few hundred people are going to read it. I can write an article, and so and so. 
or I can, I can use my energy to work on these partnerships and millions of people are going to watch it. So we're at that stage now where we're trying to do things. We're doing innovative things. For example, we started a project with a, a guy in North Carolina called Recados, R-E-K in the number two. In Spanish, Recados uh, means messages, where the research shows that s uh, something like 70% of Latino immigrants, especially Spanish-dominant immigrants, they may not Facebook, a lot of them don't Facebook or MySpace or Twitter, but almost everybody has, can get a text message on their phone. So now we're working a project where we're sending out text messages to people, right? Boom. Every day you get a text message, right? So that's an kind of innovative way to reach out to folks in these, in these places. So that's just a, a, a little bit of the kinds of stuff we're doing. So I, I don't know if there's time for a question and answer. Okay, so question and answer. Anybody, don't be shy. Yes, sir. So, so you mentioned kind of the shaving down of numbers, you know, the 50% to 25 to 10, but you didn't really distinguish between, you know, documented versus undocumented. That's kind of the first part of my, uh, of more of a comment, and, and I'm wondering how that feeds into what activism looks like on the ground now for you. Okay, very good, good question. Okay, so um, these numbers are public school numbers, so the undocumented is included in there. Although, um, there are, you can get data that has to do with foreign born, so you can get all sorts of data foreign born uh, students. So foreign born, um, by and large, are, are not doing as well, right? Although there's caveats there. It, it kind of really depends on your cultural capital, right? Um, a lot of people, I, we used to say AG means EG, right? So academically gifted really means economically gifted, right? So you can almost tell, right, the, the person comes from an economic class where there's a lot of cultural capital, a lot of formal history of formal schooling, right? Um, uh, one way that people look at it is look at the mother. What was the formal schooling of the mother? And that kind of indicates, right? But here's something that's real interesting that's happening. This is brand new. Um, let me think of the guy's name right now. Uh, we just published a piece a year ago in the Journal of Latino Education. Uh, let me see if I, if I can find it. Hold on. Da, 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 da. <coughs> oh, I get, I remember. Alejandro Covarrubias. If you, you can look at it, it's in the Journal of Latinos in Education. We just published it not too long ago. So here's the interesting thing, is that the effects of the civil rights movement are starting to erase, and we can actually document it for Latino students, right? Um, um, using the same adage, right? So if you are... Um, whatever middle class means, right? You got a little bit of money in the bank and your parents are doing pretty good, then uh, you got a better chances of going to the university, right? We kind of know, we know that, right? So the latest numbers show, actually show that, that, that that's not happening for Latinos anymore. That, um, that we have well-to-do second generation Latinos who got a little bit of money, they got some real capital but it's not, still not translating into college completion, unfortunately. I would say, to make a, to shorten it, look at Alejandro Covarrubias, and he kind of revisits it, revisits um, the early work of uh, Daniel Solorzano, right? So probably Daniel Solorzano, probably the most well known scholar for this Latino, looking at the Latino Chicano pipeline, all right? And, and there's a whole UCLA working group that looks at the pipeline. Uh, but the, the adage of, of, um, of uh, the class, right, that your economic class is determining for Latinos, unfortunately, the effects of the civil rights movement and all, because really, when you think about the civil rights movement, it, it really helped create a class. It cre helped create a, a black middle class, a Chicano Latino middle class, and all these things. But for Latinos, the numbers start to show that even that's declining. So even, even uh, second generation uh, 
and that's that's uh, bad news for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so since you mentioned the fact that you use the internet as a way um, to do some of your advocacy work, how effective would you say is it using the internet as a platform to actually reach sort of um, maybe not the other working professionals, but the people who you know you're really trying to advocate for and on behalf. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of a it's um, I don't know love hate relationship. No, it's um, the struggle is obvious is to create more access, right? So we work on like even San Bernardino County, uh, where I come from, it's the largest county in the United States. Uh, it's larger than seven states in the in the United States. It's larger than South Carolina, for example, um, and that's just the county I work in that um, in our county we have a very low, um, not a lot of people have internet yet, especially poor people, right? Not, not, not just Latino, you know, poor black, poor white, everybody. So, um, so there's, there's a movement to try to get people connected, you know, in, in that way. At the same time, that seems to be, since we don't own CBS, the doing internet shows seems to be pretty good. But one thing that we found out is, is that most of the people who watch the internet stuff or listen to it, it's post. So very few people watch it live, maybe because they, they know they can always come back to it, they can, it's archived. So when we do things, um, uh, maybe, I don't know, 30 people are online watching it. But then the next couple weeks, you get hundreds of people watching it, because they just they go back and revisit it. Knowing so, so I don't know if that answers your question, but there's a, it's both things, right? The, obviously, the internet is not a way to reach everyone, but it does maximize, at least now, it maximizes the opportunity to do outreach, to do promotion. But it's not enough, so that's why we're now we're doing it. We're we're experimenting with the text messages, and um, and it, the internet is akin, I guess, to maybe the public sphere, the public square. Uh, think of the way we used to think of, I wrote another book on democracy and the, the analogy of the public square, right? So people would go to the public square and you would interact with people who were different from yourself. You would have conversations about politics, about whatever, and then that shaped, somehow that shaped the, the democratic impulse of that society. Uh, well, um, since the 80s, since the Reagan 80s, the public sphere has actually shrink, shrunk, shrank. I don't know what it is. Shrunk, shrank, right? So, uh, so because of that, there's less opportunities for us to mingle with people who are different from ourselves in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of religion, all those things, language. So the internet, in a sense, has kind of became, has become our public sphere where we can interact, interact with those. Right? Yes, ma'am. Have you ever thought about using it for uh, protests? You know, to generate, let's say, Yeah, yeah. In fact, we have, um, um, uh, like, for example, with the Dream Act stuff, that the vote that came up uh, a few months back for the Dream Act. Yeah, we do our part. We send out. So what we do is we plug into everything. So um, you know, we have people who their job is Facebook is that's their job. That's their full time job is to do Facebook all the time for these projects. Somebody in MySpace and and the Twitter and all this this and that. And then we send out listservs. I reach somewhere on, on my listservs, um, when I send out a message, probably about close to 400,000 people at that moment, right? So we send out emails, we do this, we send out blasts, we do all sorts of things. So now the new, it, it, I'm, I'm actually excited about the text messaging because imagine you get a text message. Hey, there's a protest uh, or, you know, and people can subscribe with this text message, they can subscribe within their own local zip code or area code. Um, so you can get new news that's happening locally in real time, mm. right? And that the potential is there. Yes, Pote potential is there. So we've sent out things, uh, you know, pet petitions for the Dream Act, for this, for that. Um, we've sent out a bunch of stuff on the stuff that's going on in Arizona. Um, uh, one thing that we do is uh, we. I'm also the commissioner for for uh, financial aid in California, so I'm a state official. So I, I actually, I, 
I also advocate on behalf of students to get for financial aid, right? And we, we do workshops, we do all sorts of things. Uh, a lot of our work is really, I guess what you'd call infra-political, right? If you kind of look at the uh, kind of a, a theory of politics is that um, a lot of the work really is infra-political, it's below the radar, so it's very petty, it's the everyday stuff, right? And then something happens and all of a sudden there's, a, there's an eruption, a cultural eruption, right? And so during this eruption, that's when you get people protesting and, and you get the thing like at UC Davis and you get the Occupy groups and this and that. But that, you know, but that always comes down. What always is steady is the infra-political. So, we, always, so we're, we really work on the infra-political. Right? That, I mean, if you look at strategically, that's where we're at. And then opportunity arises, then of course you're part of the eruption. But the work is always, I mean, I know that's the way I look at it, uh, theoretically, is that, at that level. When is the infra-political? That it doesn't show up, okay, so most people think of politics as voting, mm -hmm. as voting, right? And, those kinds, and, and that's a very small sh definition of politics, right? Mm -hmm. po politics is. Well, you know, you, you, yeah. you understand what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all, all sorts of things related to what would be political, mm -hmm. things that are political in nature. And so it's sort of like the everyday stuff, sending out email messages, sending out a Twitter, whatever, that that, in a sense, could be political um, because you're, you're building momentum, you're building awareness, you're building advocacy. And then uh, if you're in the right place in the right time, then, um, uh, the, you know, you can be part of the eruption, part of the cultural eruption, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, you'll have time to speak with Dr. Murillo at a reception on, on the other side of the